عن بناء سلاسل التوريد المستدامة أفضل الممارسات والحلول يقدمه سعادة نائب الرئيس التنفيذي للتحالفات الاستراتيجية بالجمعية الأمريكية لإدارة سلاسل الإمداد السيد دوغلاس كنت Ladies and gentlemen Please join me welcoming Mr. Douglas Kent. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Great. Perfect. Everybody's still awake. That's good. Um, I want to talk to you about something that I think is uh, the passion of most of us here, um, but also one of the biggest challenges that we have within the industry. And that is, I think, that when we think about the topic of building a sustainable supply chain, we have two fundamental problems. The aspiration is higher than the reality. That's the number one problem. And we don't know how to operationalize that into the daily decision process that we have within the supply chain today. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what we can do together about that. So first, I'm going to start by just giving you a little bit of an introduction to ASM, or the Association of Supply Chain Management, which you may also know as APICS. Talk about some key sustainability concepts for us, and then how do we operationalize this into the business, and what do we do as an association to assist with that process. So first things first, just a little bit about the association. The Association of Supply Chain Management is the largest supply chain association in the world. We now are close to closing out the year with more than 48,000 members in over 100 countries, represented by our training partners that we have across the globe, including nine here in the kingdom. We have certified literally thousands of professionals. Our primary goal is to increase the talent in supply chain management to ensure that we can transform our supply chains for the future, including a transformation towards sustainability. We'll talk a little bit about this as well, but we're also a signatory and quite committed in our partnership with the United Nations Global Compact and the achievement of the SDG goals. You heard a little bit about that earlier today. Several presentations also made reference to that. I had the luxury a few weeks ago of speaking at the United Nations General Assembly, talking about sustainable supply chains, and in particular, about achieving a supply chain that is not only sustainable, but provides living wages to the employees who work within the supply chain. The sad part about the goals, the SDG goals, and its progression, if you've been following our progression, I'll show you a chart on this a little bit later, but the SDG goals were established in 2015, which means we're halfway towards our 2030 agenda. The most recent reporting on our progression of SDG goals suggested that only 18% of our SDG goals were on target, 18%, not 80, 18%. And in the past two years, 15% of the SDGs went backwards. So when we think about sustainability, we need to think about how to do things differently. And really, the heart of that is going to lie within us as a profession. It's going to be our responsibility to create these concepts, that, to take that aspiration and to operationalize that into the future. One of the things that we as an association have been doing is to recognize the need to bring forward both standards and training, learning and development opportunities for individuals to really understand the concepts of supply chain. On the right-hand side here, you can see in addition to our certifications we have at large, we have also introduced the world's first enterprise certification for sustainability standards. This is a very, very comprehensive set of supply chain-specific sustainability standards that will help you understand what level of maturity that you have across the supply chain, in particular across what we'll refer to as the triple bottom line. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a moment. So in addition to the standards, we also just a month ago released our first training course on building a sustainable supply chain. This is a two-day course that is not only good for supply chain professionals, but also what we refer to as supply chain adjacents those individuals within our organization who work with supply chain, but we don't still oftentimes speak the same language. 
even more particularly when it comes to sustainability. So when we think about sustainability within the association world, it isn't just about the green aspect of sustainability. It's actually what we refer to as the triple bottom line. People, profit, planet, if you think about it that way. Of course, we need to deliver a sustainable supply chain that meets the economic requirements that our stakeholders expect from us. This is undeniable. No supply chain that isn't making money is going to be sustainable. But in order to do that, we also need to make sure that we're delivering a supply chain that also focuses on ensuring that in the daily processes of the decisions that we make within supply chain, they give equal and robust enough consideration to also what that means from a social and from an ecological perspective. Now, I'm very careful in my words. We give equal consideration to the economic advantages of our supply chain, while at the same time respecting the social and the ecological aspects of that. This is what we refer to as the triple bottom line. You've probably heard this concept before, well defined in our ASCM APICS dictionary, in terms of taking a look at an approach that measures the economic, social, and environmental impacts of the organization's activities with the intent of creating value for both its stakeholders and society at large. So you can see that this is really taking it down to an operating model level. Your operating model needs to respect these equalized trade-offs across the three triple bottom line aspects. Our strategies, therefore, again, that movement from aspiration to operationalizing the supply chain means that that aspiration has to be embedded in our supply chain strategies, has to be embedded into our strategies and our operational decision-making processes. And in addition to that, we need to have a comprehensive way that we can account for our performance. We can understand how well we are performing. There are too many organizations around the world that pat themselves on the back saying, look at what we've done. Look how much recycled material we've done. As you heard from the, from the presentation earlier, when we think about circularity, we can't recycle our way out of climate change. This is scientifically defined. If we believe that the only way to save the planet is to continue a process of recycling and not circular economy, our planet is not going to be alive in 15 years. So we need to keep the focus on all aspects of how well we are doing and accounting and performing and measuring our performance. One of the key aspects that we recognize as an association relative to supply chain and supply chain education is that it's, it's a little bit confusing, right? In the supply chain world, we call it the alphabet soup, right? It's GHG and ESG and SASB and et cetera, a lot of acronyms to really get us to focus on really what is the right thing. ESG is one of those things. ESG is a subset of sustainability at large. The concept of sustainability is much more holistic than just ESG. The good thing about ESG is that it's one way in which companies report themselves and their progress because it's important to investors. Investors in, in who are taking um, investments in your organization as stakeholders are interested to be assured that your compliance factors don't put you at risk, that you are in fact to some degree managing the business in an ESG way, taking a look at the environmental, the social, and the governance aspects of that. And that becomes very important. The good news about having ESG as a standard over the last few years is that 93% of the world's organizations actually report on ESG. It's quite transparent. It is, however, not mandatory. It is still not mandatory, and most of the world sits under a, a non-mandatory compliance factor of reporting ESG. Perhaps the region that is the most advanced relative to regulation in this space is actually Europe. Europe has been leading the pack for a number of years on reporting on ESG. Even in the US, for example, it is not consistent in the US for reporting on ESG or the need to report on ESG. Eight of the 50 states in the US have mandatory ESG compliance. So 
you can see it's a very bifurcated world in terms of ESG reporting. The good thing about that ESG reporting is that it allows us to avert the negative potential aspects that ESG is meant to help to serve. And those are things like making sure that we don't, uh, that we take advantage of any e energy efficiency we have, the reductions associated with waste, that we don't have in our supply chain, anywhere in our supply chain, tier one, two, or three, human rights abuses, corruption practices that happen, and that of course that we are meeting whatever the mandatory um, government regulations aspects are. So ESG is a good thing. ESG alone, however, will not satisfy what we need in order to create the world that you want to create, in particular as stated in your Vision 2030. So ESG is an important aspect, but of course not the only important aspect of that. It's been a long journey through ESG, right? It started way back in the 80s when we took a look at some of the natural disasters were happening. We started to get more concerned about the climate. You had the Kyoto Protocol, which first time ever introduced the need to reduce greenhouse gases. And then several other events, including the introduction of the UN Sustainability Goals back in 2015, as I mentioned earlier. But we continue to progress on that, including the Paris climate aspect, which um, 190 plus countries or entities have signed up to relative to ensuring, again, that we try to control the climate aspect in particular. That means that we have to put that focus again back into this, this community to help to resolve that. And we call this the Conference of Parties. If you've heard of COP, COP, COP28, um, I'll have the luxury of being at COP28 again this year. Uh, COP28, of course, is the conversion of different uh, players across the globe, trying to make sure that we have reporting relative to our climate aspects and ensuring that we're trying to meet the climate change requirements as set forth by the United Nations. And that becomes a very uh, critical aspect of, of what we do. In addition to that, in terms of the initial COP21, this of course was the initial focus that was put forward, which said basically we can't allow the world to heat up beyond two degrees more than the naturalized or uh, pre-industrial temperatures, right? We have now for several months exceeded that. So there are unfortunately, surprisingly, shockingly, still people that believe that climate change is not a reality. Just take a look at the number of geo events which have impacted our supply chains over the course of the last few months and last few years. It's completely unprecedented. The number of natural disasters that have impacted our supply chain have never been greater the variety and volume of natural disaster related supply chain impacts has been greater. We've had more of those in the last two years than we had in the decade preceding. So it's undeniable that we need together as a supply chain community to control the impacts relative to our environment. Um, otherwise, we're gonna continue to contribute to the level of disruption that we've seen over the last few months as well. So how do we do that? There are a number of targets, there are a number of things that of course people are focused on. One of those, probably the primary one, is to take a look at the reduction of fossil fuels as a contrib contributor to our energy problem. Um, the other of course is to take a look at uh, deforestation and the aspects that are happening relative to that. Um, there's been a natural swift speed up to the use of electrical vehicles, not only personally but in terms of for logistics aspects, etc. And then, of course, increase the amount of investment that we have relative to renewables. So we take all of this on board and we think about as an association, what is it that we can do to help the community at large? How can you, how can you take this understanding and actually do something with it? Many of you are probably familiar with the SCORE model. The SCORE model is the intellectual property of our association. It's been around since 1996. It's by far the most definitively used uh, framework to understand, diagnose, and measure your supply chain. There are more than 5,000 organizations around the globe that have utilized the SCORE model to assist them 
in understanding their level of performance across the supply chain to model both their current as well as their future state of supply chain. What we also recognized is the SCORE model clearly did not represent enough of the sustainability aspects in its previous version. So in the most recent release of the SCORE model, we did a couple of things. One of the things we did was to add and reinforce ESG, as you can see up here, and uh, you can see ESG, environment, social, and governance as one of the orchestrate functions. And then you see we also included things like circular supply chain management, and then you see a whole aspect relative to, to, relative to return, et cetera, that has been reinforced with a lot of supply chain best practices, which I'll share with you in a moment. The other thing that we did as an association for the first time ever was to take the SCORE model and make it freely available in its complete structure, uh, which is literally in its old printed version, was about 1,200 pages long. It's now luckily in a digital format, but we made the SCORE model freely available to anyone in the world without having to be a member of our association. We in fact did that with all of our standards, our digital standards, our sustainability standards and the SCORE model framework are now freely available to any person on the planet to use as a reference to assist them in improving their supply chain. The SCORE model is broken down into four key components. I mentioned them before. Its, pro, its most prolific use is to model out supply chains and the supply chain processes, but also what to measure, how to measure good performance. So by far the supply chain operations reference model is the definitive standard to define what is a key metric that should be used for each process within the supply chain and what's the correct calculation for that metric. This helps to take away a little bit of the inconsistency in the way in which supply chain metrics are oftentimes reported. In many complex organizations, we can take the same title of a metric, the same name of the API, and the underlying definition and calculation may be quite different depending upon where it's measured. So that process and that performance connection are critically important. But then also is what does best practice look like? What is best practices in sustainability? I'll show you in a moment. And lastly, what are the skills, what are the people skills and competencies which are also necessary in for, for a supply chain to work effectively? All of that caused us to recreate what the score mark level one process structure or performance structure should look like. This is what's known as the level one scorecard within score. You can see now clearly represented the equalized balance between some of the key resiliency metrics that are important to us across the attributes of reliability, responsiveness, and agility but you can also see the economic balance with also, as you can see, environmental and social. Again, reinforcing that triple bottom line. This is what's known as level one metrics. There's corresponding level twos and level three metrics for each of these as well. In fact, more than 250 metrics inside of the score model well-defined. This also allows us to make the metrics benchmarkable. So if you have standardized definitions, calculations of metrics, then of course you can compare yourself, not only your own performance trajectory, but how well you're compared to others within your industry, how well you compare yourselves to a collection of competitors, for example. So in addition to that, we also highlighted a number of key best practices around sustainability. This is just a sampling of some of the new best practices. I mentioned some of them before relative to circularity, relative to life cycle, emission reduction, water and energy and material efficiencies, and et cetera. You can see all of these are new best practices which have been added in the SCORE model in its most recent release. In addition to that, just to highlight again, the two main orchestrate functions that were added into the model that are well-defined now is the orchestrate number 10 and orchestrate number 13. Again, re-emphasizing the importance as ESG is a contributor to sustainability at large, but also to make sure that we have a circular economy. We'll hit on that one a little bit, both of these in a little bit more detail. Those are two additions to the orchestrate that relate back to sustainability. Again, the SCORE model, if you go into score.ascm.org, is downloadable, full access. 
Uh, sorry, not downloadable because it's accessed, <laughs> it's accessed digitally, but you have full access to the model, which allows you to cascade into its various process levels, et cetera. Um, and then you can see that ESG is, of course, then this is the hierarchy of ESG, starting first with basically aligning or developing a sustainability plan all the way through ensuring that you're properly reporting um, and taking remediation actions with anything that looks like a vulnerability or a weakness relative to ESG within your environment. Again, 93% of the world's companies report on ESG. It's important you understand how well you are doing and making sure that you don't have any gaps in the way in which you're managing uh, your compliance factors today. The other major addition, as I mentioned, was the addition of orchestrate number 13, which is around the circular economy. This is important because we need to move in order to save the planet. <laughs> hate to get dramatic about that, but again, it's very important that we, we cause ourselves to be challenged with moving from a linear economy to a circular economy. This is very, very difficult. Why? Because fundamentally what this means is that we have to have two organizational pieces talk to each other effectively, the design chain and the supply chain. In order to achieve a circular economy, it means it starts initially with the design. We have to design for reuse, for repurpose, et cetera. This becomes necessary. It's not a natural connection that organizationally we typically have. So when we think about circular and that movement from a linear economy to a circular economy, it does require the intersection, the conversation, the st strategy, the mix between strategies, between um, design chain people and supply chain people, which is critically important. Again, you can see of those processes here, and then you can see the sub-processes taking a look at reductions of all different types, energy usage, et cetera, as I mentioned, extending the product life cycle, and then recovery for either reuse or for repurpose. Again, this is just a very high level what's contained within the model. I do encourage you to take a look at the SCORE model and then you can see the best practices well outlined, the corresponding definitions and calculations of sustainability metrics, and then of course you can see some of the breakdowns of the processes, particularly around ESG um, and around the circular economy. Um, again, just taking a look at as a signatory to the Global Compact, is to take a look at our progressions towards the SDG goals. I already gave you some sad insights to that. We're basically overall, um, on average, about 23% of the progression that we need to be at 50% of the timeline, which means we need to accelerate. We, the UN launched uh, at the Global Compact meeting and the climate meetings in New York a few weeks ago, a fast forward program basically trying to encourage organizations to move more swiftly to get the job done. Um, obviously, we're going to wake up in 2030 and we won't have made the progression that we need, um, which is going to be um, overall harmful to us. So it becomes important that we take a look at that um, SDG progression and commit ourselves to, to the 17 goals. Within supply chain, of course, we don't impact all 17 of the supply chain um, of the SDG goals, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We do, however, hit on a number of those. So one of the other things we did was to try to take the mystery out of that. So within a supply chain, where is it that we typically impact the SDG goals? So two relationships that became very important and to make this transparent to supply chain professionals. One is the UN to validate the connectivity between what we believe are supply chain processes and their impacts to the SDGs, and the other is to GRI, to make sure that the reporting that we need, the global reporting, also matches up. And I'm gonna share with you what that looks like in a moment. Again, one of the things we needed to do is to make sure that our sustainability standards were accessible by the industry and that they well represented the opportunities within that supply chain. So these standards can be used to validate your sustainability strategy, but also to make sure that your processes and your best practices well represent what is necessary to achieve sustainability and support also ESG and other types of reporting. We built the standards based upon the best of the best. So we took 
already known suggestions, if you will, already known standards, and took a look at what, ha what was inside of the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, what is inside of Malcolm Baldridge, what is inside of ISO, what is inside of everything you can see on the left-hand side, as well as their own body of knowledge in the creation of our sustainability standards. So all of those pieces help to inform it, but to encapsulate it into one digestible set of standards, which is supply chain specific. And this is the outline of what those standards look like. So you can see inside of that, of course, is the supply chain processes. And then you can also see surrounding that is that lens of the economic, the ethical, and the ecological aspects of the supply chain. In addition to that are what are key enablers, enablers like strategy, enablers like governance, workforce, technology. And then the outer layer are who are the stakeholders which are impacted. So, of course, if we're taking a look at supply chain, it's important that our stakeholders include both customers and suppliers. It'd be a little naive not to include those, but also to take a look at the impact of the community and also our stakeholders relative to, to government, particularly around some of the compliance aspects. This is an example of some of the areas within the supply chain that represent process excellence that, if done right, could have a positive impact on sustainability. And these are some of the processes that do that, right? Things like responsible sourcing, things like supplier diversity, things like making sure that we have electronic returns capabilities that reduce the amount of impact, making sure that we do supply chain and network design optimization that again does a trade between cost and service levels as well as the impacts to the environment. This is the lineup that I shared with you earlier, this is how the sustainability standards themselves and the themes that you see on the left-hand side align to the 17 SDG goals, and then also how it aligns to the global reporting initiatives, the different GRI metrics. So now we take all of this alphabet soup and we create a recipe for organizations to use this to actually improve their supply chain. They have full access to the SCORE framework, our sustainability standards. We've already made the connections between how bettering the processes can contribute to your progression on SDGs, as well as the connectivity to the GRM metrics. So these organizations sit in our network to try to make sure that we bring to the community this level of advancement and understanding sustainability and the supply chain. I'll just leave you with a couple of thoughts. One is that our supply chain professionals across the globe that truly can make a difference. Not all of what is needed to be achieved within sustainability is within the supply chain, but a heck of a lot of it is, right? If you take a look at the, <coughs> excuse me, if you take a look at the QR code here, this is where you can download also our certification standards. Of course, you can also find it on the website. Again, our standards, both the SCORE standards and the sustainability standards are freely available. It's a very comprehensive way to understand what is necessary to achieve sustainability within the supply chain. You have a vision here in the kingdom, right? It's very much focused on making sure that we're very much focused on making sure you achieve that vision, right? In terms of making sure you have the right society, that you have the right economics, and that, in essence, you become a nation which is a force to be reckoned with, I'll say, right? Um, we would like to be with you on the journey, and I hope that the things that we're doing is going to help you achieve your vision. Thank you very much.